And we're back. Okay. Uh, we are here with our first talk of the evening. Um, this is the one that we probably talked about looking forward to. Um, we're going to talk to Cordelia McGee Tubb, who has probably, she is one of my favorite names in accessibility right now. And she has one of my favorite names in accessibility <laughs> right now because it's so much fun to say. Um, we are going to talk about accessible comics. So, hi, Cordelia. Hello. Um, I'm here with, with Matt and Leone. Um, I'm going to give you. Uh, I'm going to give you control of the screen here. Now you Ooh, have it. Um, okay, thank you. And um, we will turn it over to you to do your thing. Awesome. Okay. Well, yay! I'm super excited to be the first talk of hashtag ID24. Uh, use that on Twitter and your other favorite social media networks. Um, so as Billy mentioned, I'm Cordelia. I go by Cordelia Dillon on the internet. Um, and the relevant background information on me is. I've been an amateur cartoonist for most of my life. Um, and as of the past few years, I've also been an accessibility specialist. Um, and for those who can't see my screen, I've got an illustration of myself waving with a giant speech balloon that says, I'm an amateur cartoonist and an accessibility specialist. Um, but I actually am no longer an amateur cartoonist, fun fact, uh, because I just decided to go off and get a master's degree in comics. So now I am officially a master of comics, uh, which is a title I'm still trying to live up to. But that's why I kind of wanted to talk about um, comics today at ID24, because something that I realized um, as I actually started comics grad school and started my accessibility career in the same year is that the deeper I got into each of them, uh, the further away they seem to be. Because um, in comic school, we were drawing all these pictures, and then I'd go back to work the next day and um, make products accessible for people who are blind, and there was this disconnect between what I was doing at school and what I was doing at work. Um, so I'm really interested in bridging those two things um, by way of accessible comics. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and before we get into that, I wanted to share one of my favorite lessons that I learned in grad school, which is that comics are about relationships. So on our first day of grad school, the chair of our department told us, first of all, that everything is a comic. And we'll get back to that later on in this talk. Um, and that the fundamental building blocks of a comic are relationships. And he identified these, uh, these key relationships in, in three different ways. So, the first relationship in comics is the relationship between an image and image. For example, here I've got um, a square illustrated panel of myself clutching my stomach and looking down, potentially in pain. Um, but in the second panel, my head is thrust up and I'm smiling, so I'm actually clutching my stomach with laughter. So that's a story told in just two different images. Um, the second type of relationship in comics is that of um, image and text. Uh, so here I've got a single panel of me raising one of my eyebrows skeptically as I say, are you serious? Um, and then the final type of relationship in comics is the relationship between image and culture. Um, so even in a single image, you can tell a story as long as the reader is familiar with that reference. Um, so here I've got um, myself as the Mona Lisa, and I should preface this by saying I'm an autobio cartoonist, so you'll see a lot of illustrations of me throughout the day. Um, so uh, here I am as the Mona Lisa. Um, and I really want you to keep in mind these three different types of relationships as we talk about uh, how to make these relationships accessible for all different types of readers. Um, so comics is a pretty cool medium. I think a lot of us are fans of comics. Uh, and I think there are a lot of reasons why comics resonate so much with people. And, and the biggest one that is just kind of slightly intangible is that they're just such an expressive medium. Uh, for example, here I've got um, on the slide a page from Little Nemo in Slumberland uh, by Windsor McKay. This is from 1905. And it's uh, this Little Nemo character who you may be familiar with um, is walking into Slumberland on stilts. And as he starts walking further and further into Slumberland, the panels get taller and taller to kind of communicate the the depth of this space that he's in. And when he starts to fall off of the stilts, the panels get smaller and smaller. And I think that's one of the really beautiful ways that comics works um, as a creative medium of expressing this feeling of space by literally changing um, the bounding boxes that you're interacting with. Um, 
similarly, I like one of my absolute favorite comics um, is El Defo, which is C.C. Bell's um, roughly autobiographical book about how she lost her hearing at a young age. And this page here on the screen is one that really resonates with me a lot, where um, it's, it's the moment where the protagonist, who's a young girl who is depicted right now as a, as a rabbit, um, first discovers that she's lost her hearing. Um, so in these panels, her mom is, is saying something to her. There's a speech balloon coming out of her mom's mouth, um, but the speech balloon is large and empty. And, and what's really beautiful about this is that this comic um, is, is giving sound space in a way that I think is very unique to the comics medium. Uh, so this is something that I think is very, like I said, very specific to comics, and it's something that we want to make sure is shared with everyone. Um, another thing I'll just mention about comics is that they share stories and information in a really easily consumable way. There's a reason that people often refer to comics as an accessible medium, and we'll get to, shortly we'll get to why that's a kind of ironic expression for it. But um, uh, a lot of times um, I, I've heard from librarians that comic books are really great for students with learning disabilities because the comic books are really easy for them to consume content, to, to consume um, information probably better than, than reading in a textbook. And they're just a great way to distill these really large concepts. For example, uh, The Nib, if you're familiar with it, is an online comics publication that's been doing a ton of political com comics recently. So they've got a lot of material to work with all over the world. Um, and they also tell really interesting long form personal comics. So there's a lot Basically, I'm just rambling about comics because I love them, um, but there's just a lot of really cool stuff that's happening in the comics medium. And one thing that I've really enjoyed about it is, is finding ways that I can use comics to actually teach about accessibility. Um, my favorite snarky comic that I've made is this one of this character called Designer Dude, who has a large handlebar mustache and a very large beard. And he's kind of a stereotypical designer I've guy I've created. And he's standing there looking uncomfortable with three people kind of smushed in around him. And he says, why are you all standing so close to me? Um, and one of the people around him says, hovering is the only way we can interact with you, uh, which is my little joke about how designers often hide really important interactions on hover. Um, but you can actually use comics for more um, important accessibility, uh, or, or I guess less cynical accessibility uses. Um, like when I was at Salesforce UX, I worked with Jesse Hausler on a series of posters to promote the uses of reusable components. Um, so here we've got a modal component that's got, that's showing off all of its features. It's, it's a modal that's smiling and has arms and legs and is waving and is saying, give me all your focus. Um, so there's a lot of fun stuff you can do uh, with comics. And again, one of my absolute favorite comics um, is, is this one by Constanza Jovanizny. Um, I think I pronounced her last name incorrectly and I apologize. Um, so this is um, from her comics, The Postcard Guide to Braille. So this is a long, com long web comic that's about Braille, that's introducing readers to um, what Braille is, how it works, the basics of it, and she's using comics as a way to um, share that information, which is really cool. Um, but as you have probably guessed by now, um, while we can use comics to talk about accessibility, most comics have an accessibility barrier, which is that they rely so strongly on visuals. Um, comics, as I mentioned, like, uh, those three different types of relationships, each one includes an image. And for people with a variety of vision impairments, uh, that can mean that this, that this wonderful accessible medium for distilling information in a useful way is um, not accessible at all. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about today are ways to make comics more accessible for um, people with vision impairments. I should mention that I am not I um, wear glasses, but I do not have a um, larger visual impairment. So I'm really going to be speaking from the, uh, the mindset of a comics creator who is interested in making my, the things that I'm creating accessible to all. Um, so I will be talking about the experience of 
or I will be talking about how to make comics that can be read by people who are blind, but um, the experience of reading that is not my experience. Something I have experienced, yeah, so uh, if I take off my glasses, things get very blurry, like this image on the screen, and very illegible. Um, sometimes I do have uh, migraines with aura, where I get these giant clouds and can't really see anything. Um, but 90% of the time, I don't have too much difficulty reading comics. I do often run into a lot of accessibility barriers that I'd say a lot of um, comics readers run into, which is really legibility barriers. Um, so my personal experience when I'm reading comics is, is the text legible? Uh, we talk a lot in web accessibility about making sure that um, text is high enough contrast. That's totally true for comics, both in print and um, and on web, so making sure that our contrast is is good, um, not just for text, but also for important little visual pieces that we don't want people to lose. Making sure our font size is large, so people don't have to squint at our comics, um, and that our kerning is, is appropriate so people don't misread things. Um, and on web, this is something I'll get into a little bit later, thinking about things like, is it possible to highlight the text in a comic while you're reading it. Sometimes it's, it's, for a lot of people, it's easier to follow along with text if you can actually stick your cursor in there and highlight as you go. Um, so that's something to consider here. Um, another thing I often think about is like, is a comic high enough resolution? If it's super blurry and, and small, um, it'll be hard for anyone, um, even people with, with you know, 20, 20 vision, to understand all the details of that comic. Uh, and then finally, is it written in my language? And this is really important uh, for transcription, which we're gonna get to in a second. And oh, wait, there's one more thing. Also, is it easy to find again in bookmark? Um, so this is one of my giant pet peeves on the internet of I find something amazing and I forget to bookmark it and then I try to Google it forever and it's a, a picture of text and I've totally lost it forever because I can't search for it. Um, so let's talk about how we can solve um, some of those problems I just mentioned, but also how we can make existing comics accessible uh, for readers who may not be able to see them for whatever reason. And that really uh, starts with transcription. So for transcription, really important for accessibility is making sure that we're providing a text transcript that can be read by assistive technology such as screen readers but also super important for search engines. If you think about it, if you create this transcript, it, can, it is readable by robots in a way that um, currently just images are not. Um, so you can have, um, if you write a transcript, it'll be accessible to assistive tech, to search engines, and to automatic translators. As I mentioned earlier, actually, in my, in my explorations for this talk, I found a lot of really cool comics written in Spanish my Spanish isn't really that good, it's, it's passable, but it's a lot easier to just highlight some text and dump it into Google Translate. So that's another great reason why transcripts are useful from an accessibility and internationalization perspective. Um, there's a really awesome website called Oh No Robot um, where you can actually, that's indexed a ton of different um, web comics around the web and you can type in search terms um, and search for whatever comics have been transcribed by this service. So they currently have, oh my goodness, they have 144,282 comics that have been transcribed through this service uh, by volunteer transcribers, which is super great because it means that it's easily discoverable um, for every user. And it also means that people with vision impairments can tell what these comics are, are about. Um, so, some things to think about as you're writing transcripts. I would highly encourage if anyone watching this is a web cartoonist to um, create uh, transcripts of your comics. And there's a lot of wiggle room here. Um, there, there aren't any like defined guidelines quite yet around how to transcribe comics, so it's still an emerging field. Uh, but I think the most important thing you can think about is, or several of the important things you can think about is, what is the tone of, of this work? Um, you don't want to have a transcript that's too clinical, and this applies also to alt text on the web as well. Like you want to, comics are fun. Um, sometimes they're very sad, but usually comics are pretty fun. 
um, and uh, really creative. And so if you're writing a text description of the images in them, you want to make sure that you are conveying that, that same tone in the text descriptions. So one thing that I really um, like to do is look at Netflix as an example. Um, if you have watched any Netflix shows with audio descriptions, each of the, at least the shows that I've watched um, with audio descriptions, each one has a different voice for the audio descriptions that really matches the personality of the show. Um, like if you think about, I think it's Daredevil has a like super fantastic audio descriptions. They should win a thousand awards for that. Um, so think about how to uh, really embody the voice of your comic in your transcription. Think about if this were an old time radio show or a podcast, which is a new time radio show, uh, how would you tell this story to someone? And what information would you include? How much information do you want to give away to the reader um, if they can't, how much is too much information? Um, an exercise that I've done with other cartoonists when we've been thinking about how to transcribe comics is to literally, we'll sit back to back and um, I will hold a piece of paper in my hand of, of a comic page and I will tell the other person the pieces of the page, like I will tell them how to draw it or tell them the, the information in it that I think is useful for drawing and they'll try to draw the same exact page. And that's a really interesting exercise because it forces you to think about what is the most important thing about this comic page? Is, is the layout important or is it the dialogue? Like does it matter that this person is wearing a yellow shirt? Should I indicate the color of every single person's shirt or is that way too much information? Um, so it really helps you create this hierarchy of the information in the comic that's that's relevant to share. Um, and um, it's a really fantastic exercise. Um, I'd also highly recommend reading uh, On Describing Comics, which is an essay by Leanna Kerr um, about how she transcribes both uh, a comic called Brood Hollow and Watchmen for one of her friends who's blind. And it is like the best thing that I've read on the internet about transcribing comics. She really goes in deep about how she decides um, when certain things are significant to share. For example, with colors, it might be too much information to bombard the reader with the color of every single person's shirt. But if there's a color like a red or a yellow that is thematically significant, she'll weave it in. Um, so she really d dives into the nuances of how to describe comics well there. And one of my favorite quotes from, from her talking about um, this, the Brood Hollow comics, I'll just read a small segment of it is, she says, I note if there's comic shorthand, such as short lines around someone's head indicating surprise, dotted lines indicating the direction someone is looking in, or stars indicating pain. That's because the author has chosen to present this as a comic not as a novel or a video, and I want to preserve the feeling or the feeling of experiencing something that's different from other media. Um, so that, that's what she wrote about uh, transcribing comics, and I really love that because it's about um, not just, I, I think I mentioned radio shows actually earlier on this slide, not just translating it into another medium, but really thinking about what are the comics techniques that are really important to this story. For example, the the large speech balloons that I was talking about earlier in, um, in El Defo, what are these significant things that can only be told in a comic? Making sure that you don't forget about those in your transcript as well. Um, so an example of a transcribed panel uh, by Liana um, is here. So this is the very first panel of Brood Hollow. Um, and I won't describe the image, I'll just read out her description of it. So she says, white background, panel one. A young man is laying on his back on a flat, armless couch. His eyes closed and his hands folded over his belly. He is drawn in a flat, cartoonish style reminiscent of 1930s pop art, with a shock of hair sticking up from the top of his head and a rounded face. He's wearing brown pants, a buttoned up tan shirt, and red suspenders. Someone off screen says, Mr. Zane, you were about to tell me what brought you here. Zane replies, a taxi, ha ha. Then more quietly, no, I walked. I haven't seen any taxis. Um, 
So what I love about her panel description here is she identifies this as the first panel, and she almost writes it like prose, but she points out uh, important parts of the actual drawing style, not just the content of, of the scene, not just what's happening in the scene, but also he's drawn in a flat cartoonish style. Um, so you can really start to get a sense of, of the tone um, of this piece and how it's, how it's going to set the scene for the whole rest of the comic. Um, I have also been working on figuring out ways to transcribe my own comics. So as a point of comparison, I love the way that she does hers. I do mine a little bit differently, and I think that's fine. We should all experiment with this. Um, so this is the very first panel of a comic I made about 2000, my 2015. And because my comic alternated a lot between text blocks and illustration blocks in a way um, that uh, was kind of unique to this comic, I decided to just immediately call that out. So my description for it is narration. If I had to pick one word to describe my 2015, it would be overwhelming. Illustration. Me lying blissfully on my couch with my feet up over the back cushions, one striped sock and one polka dot sock. There's a plop sound effect, like I just fell on the couch, and an arrow pointing at me that says, me, at the end of some stressful days. I think it's so nice to just lounge here like this, but I should go be productive. Um, so again, pointing out exactly what's in the scene, but also pointing out some of the stylistic elements of it, like an arrow pointing to this figure. Um, I didn't include a lot of information about this hoodie that I was wearing, the, the type of pants that I was wearing, because I didn't think that they were super important for this, but something that I would love to see happen with accessible comics down the line is like multiple layers of granularity of text description. Um, so wouldn't it be cool if you could have this description, but if you really wanted to dig in and find out more details, you could on the web maybe press a particular key to get a more detailed description. Um, so going back to my next slide here, um, in terms of formatting, I haven't found any agreed upon formatting guidelines for comic transcripts. I'm actually pretty new to this, uh, but I think you can learn a lot from, from the on transcribing comics uh, script uh, essay that Leanna wrote. But you can also learn a lot from looking at scripts, both scripts for comics, but also scripts for, uh, for movies and, and television shows and plays. Um, because a comic is kind of a little bit like an illustrated script. Um, you can also, I'm going to get back to this in a second, but there's a really cool XML project called ComicsML uh, that has a lot of potential for really structuring the way that we talk about um, accessible, uh, the way that we talk about the structure of panels. And then in terms of actually displaying this content, yes, there are, so, so on the web, if you're familiar with web development, um, you can add alt text for images. Uh, which we'll read out to a screen reader. There's also a long desk property that has a lot of, um, causes a lot of holy wars in the accessibility community uh, about whether or not we should use long desk. Um, but I would actually say for longer comics on the web, um, better, than using an alt, better than using alt text or long description is to have a visible transcript immediately after the comic or, or have a visible link to the transcript immediately after the comic. Um, because that, first of all, that provides um, information for people who um, may be using a screen reader, but it also is really great for people who can see the comic just fine, but um, also want the transcript for whatever reason. Maybe they want to translate it into another language. Maybe a few words were hard for them to read in your handwriting. So having a transcript that all of your readers can see is great, and you can use, like, an accessible accordion pattern to have that expand and collapse as, as needed. Um, and you should also really consider doing audio recordings of comics. Um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the principles of universal design and about um, giving users choice of how to consume and interact with content. And I think that's really applicable for consuming comics. Um, yes, people, um, some folks, might want to uh, consume them visually. Some folks might not be able to. So having a transcript that they can consume visually or a transcript that they can consume um, through Braille or through 
speech or uh, through um, a screen reader speaking to them would be cool, but you could also have your own audio descriptions uh, with your own tone of voice. Uh, so I'm currently working on a comic book and I'm thinking my plan for it, and I'd love to hear people's suggestions in the comments later. My plan is to have my comic book, but also have a full transcript of it and an audio version of the whole book. Um, a great example of audio comics is a company called Comics Empower, uh, which is a comics book store for blind readers. They have a ton of audio books and they have a podcast. They do a lot of amazing stuff. Um, and as we think more about uh, digital comics, something I'm really excited about that I only recently discovered is this comics XML language written by Jason McIntosh. Um, so he kind of created this XML for structuring uh, metadata about comics. And I think it's so beautiful. So here I've got some, some code that I pulled off of, his, off of his website. And I'll share these slides later so you can grab that link. Um, but he's basically got a panel XML element. And within that, he's got a URL that points to the image. And then he's got a panel desk uh, tag. Within the panel desk tag, he has the action tag, which kind of outlines, like, here's what's happening in this scene. And then he's got a speech tag, um, which tells you which character is speaking and what text they're speaking. And this is really, really cool. I'm thinking about using it uh, for one of my projects because I really like the structure um, and think that this could extend really well into um, other frameworks and potentially into assistive technology to really um, tell you what you need to know about comics and also potentially this would work out really well with like having a short description of the comic and then a longer description depending on uh, what the reader wants to hear. Um, so I've been kind of, uh, before I knew about this, I, I was working on my own HTML JavaScript um, accessible comic because I wanted to not just create a comic that had a transcript tacked on at the end, but a comic that uh, thought about accessibility from the very beginning. So here's a prototype of a comic I've been working on um, called Brocedurally Generated. It is a procedurally generated comic about tech bros. Um, and uh, the way that it works is uh, basically it starts with one panel. And if you want more panels, you can um, press a, a key on your keyboard or press this button at the bottom that says this story needs more panels to get more panels in the HTML. Um, another, I'm going to show the code for that in a second. Uh, but another thing I added into this is I wanted there to be animations in this project, but I know that animations are an issue for a lot of, um, a lot of people navigating the internet. So I've got a button at the bottom that says turn off animations. So if I were to press that button, this blinking light in the corner will stop blinking. Um, so I'm still figuring out how to make that. It's kind of a prototype of an accessible comic. Um, but basically, you can click on this story needs more panels, and you'll get more panels that will just show up um, in the UI. And you can end up with a ton of different panels. So here I'm showing um, this procedurally generated comic that pull, it, it has a, how many panels are visible on screen here? Like nine panels are visible on the screen. Um, in each one, uh, what I've done is kind of combined an image with some text. And this is HTML text, so you can highlight the text if you want to. Um, you can highlight it and copy and paste it somewhere. Uh, if you increase the screen size, the text will um, increase with that. Um, just try to make the most HTML-friendly comic I can. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about is how I've been thinking about how to provide alt text for this. And I'm using a div in this, and I feel weird about it, so don't judge me for using a div. But here is a sample panel um, from this comic that I've been working on. Uh, so each tier of this comic is, is, a, called a, is a section element with an aria label that just identifies which tier it is. Um, and then each image itself, or each panel, um, has an image, and here this one has alt text that says, a bed with a sock hanging off the side, a hairy bare leg poking out from under a blanket, a phone on the table reads 11 o'clock. Um, so this is just a plain panel that doesn't have any text in it. But for the panels that do have text, 
again, I'm generating that as um, you know, real HTML spans on the page. And so what I've been experimenting with, and again, this is an experiment, so I'd love feedback on it later on on Twitter or something, um, is including the spans in line, um, but making them ARIA hidden and, and pulling their text into the alt text for the image. So here I've got, um, this is a panel of this one guy saying, want to join our Burning Man camp? And a person off the side of the panel saying, no way. Um, and this is just auto-generated text. Um, so the way that this panel looks in the HTML is it's got two different spans for that, uh, for the, the text conversation. So I've got span aria hidden equals true, want to join our Burning Man camp, and then span aria hidden equals true, no way. And below that, I have auto-generated an image alt that combines this text in with the image description. So it says, Evan smiles while holding a disposable coffee cup. Evan says, want to join a Burning Man camp? And someone says, no way. Um, and in the underlying JavaScript for this, it actually uh, looks a lot like that, XH, that XML that I just showed you all. Of I've basically got, here's the description of the panel, which is Evan smiles while holding a disposable coffee cup. Um, and then here are the different pieces of speech. So Evan says, want to join our Burning Man camp. Someone else says, no way. Um, so I've been experimenting with this as an accessible comic where uh, a transcript isn't added, tacked on at the end, but as we're generating these panels, because it's, it's an auto-generated comic, we're also generating all of the accessible information about this. Um, and since in the actual comic, none of the men have names, uh, they do have names in the alt text so that people can identify who's speaking. Uh, so this is an approach that I'm thinking about for uh, digital comics. But I think that we can definitely push forward in digital comics. I would love to see, again, this sort of more granular um, being able to control how much information you get about the panels would be really, really cool. But in my remaining time, I wanted to jump into tactile comics because that is some really cool stuff. Uh, so two years ago, I went to CSUN, and I saw Sean Kane and Sina Baram talk about 3D printing comics. And I drew this comic of myself being excited about 3D printed comics. So this is like an illustration of me with my hands on my face, and my eyes are enormous, and my mouth is like, like I'm gritting my teeth with excitement and staring at a 3D printed tactile comic with Braille. And I'm saying, oh my gosh, accessible comics. Because um, this was my first, this CSUN that I went to two years ago was my first exposure to this idea of, of innovative, accessible comics. And I think there's a lot of really cool stuff around 3D printing um, and around Braille that's happening in the physical comic space, since we've been talking a lot about digital. Um, a really cool example that came out of Mexico a few years ago um, is Census El Universo and Sus Ojos, uh, which is a comic that it, in English it's Census, the universe in his eyes. Um, so this is a comic in Braille about an astronaut who begins to lose his vision, and the aliens um, on that planet kind of help him realize that all of his other he can experience the world um, in all of these other uh, with all of his other senses. Um, so on the screen here, I've got a picture of him, uh, a, a picture of the cover, and then a picture of an inside of the book where it's a Braille comic, um, but it also has visuals. It's written by Jorge Grajales and illustrated by Bernardo, Fernando Fernandez. Um, and it's a really beautiful comic that, again, thought about, uh, like, blind readers were its primary audience. Uh, so Braille is not tacked on afterwards. It's a core part of the experience of reading this comic. Um, and it's, I really want to get my hands on this because it looks extraordinary. Um, similarly, uh, perhaps you've seen or heard of Life by Philip Meyer. This one was a really popular Braille comic um, that I think was created in 2013. And it's a comic that um, is a sort of uh, 
trying to forget. It's a sort of abstract interpretation of a relationship between two people. Um, and they're represented as these two different braille circles. And it's a fully tactile comic. Uh, there's no speech balloons. There's no illustrations. It's all um, in, you know, raised dots. And it's something really beautiful because even as a, as a sighted person who doesn't know braille, um, I can see how I could interact with this and understand it symbolically. Um, so there's a lot of really cool stuff happening that is just accessible by default. Um, another really cool example is Shape Reader. I don't know if people have heard of Shape Reader by Ilan Menosh. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. This thing blew my mind. Um, so basically, um, the Shape Reader is, again, a, t a fully tactile comic. It's, it's tactile first um, and uh, totally symbolic. So basically what he's done is he has assigned different patterns um, to, uh, to different meanings. So some patterns will mean different um, emotions. Uh, some patterns will represent different places, different characters. So he has on the right here, I'm showing a whole grid of all of the different patterns with a key of what they represent. And they can represent places, characters, elements, actions, affections, or graphic devices. So he gives the reader this key of tactile patterns, and then he combines them in all of these really intricate, beautiful ways. Um, his first comic in this uh, was called The Arctic Circle, and I believe there's one panel that kind of has a mountaintop, and on either side there are these textures of, of emotions of anxiety or something. So you can feel this experience, and I think there's something really beautiful about feeling and emotion. Um, so I, I'm really excited about these types of comics that are kind of tearing down the idea that a comic has to have illustrations or speech balloons or even text. A comic can just be this combination of, of things that are interacting with each other. Um, I, I had a quote from him that I wanted to share, and it is very long, so I will share only part of it. Um, Let's see. So, so the way that he describes his shape reader is shape reader consists of an ever expanding repertoire of anaglyph shapes called tactograms designed to provide haptic equivalents for objects, actions, affections, characters, and so on. Um, for example, a category of shapes is assigned to affections, including, oh, wait, a category of shapes assigned to affections includes primary states such as joy fear or sadness, as well as more complex ones such as coercion, remorse, and unease. Each affection is available in three incremental intensities, and this change of magnitude is intuitively translated by the gradual thickening of the shape's core pattern. So he's doing all of the, not only does he have textures, but he has layers of those textures and is able to con like convey these really beautiful stories um, through texture alone and visually it's it's stunning as well it's a super abstract thing it looks like it could be art on on the wall of moma um, but it's telling this story uh, so i think um to kind of since i'm running low on time here um i think yeah i can sort of wrap up by saying we were talking uh, at the very beginning i talked about how there are three different types of relationships in comics. So there's image to image, image to text, and image to culture. But as we saw in these, like, t these tactile examples, image actually isn't all that important for comics. Um, if you take out the image, you can substitute it with texture, you can substitute it with um, audio, you can substitute it with all sorts of things, or not even substitute, just create a comic to begin with that doesn't even have images, that is just texture, that is just feeling. Um, so I kind of want to go back to what my professor said on that very first day of grad school, which I thought was a joke, but I've come to believe is true, that really everything is a comic. Um, I'm convinced of this. If you, if you want to talk about it more, I'm happy to talk about it. We can get super theoretical. But everything is a comic, um, which leads me to think, like, what is the future of comics going to be? If comics don't need to be text and images on paper, 
Can we have virtual reality comics? Can we have entirely audio comics? Um, can we have these comics that have multiple layers of interactivity to them uh, so that you can choose what level of description you want? I'm really excited about where this all is going. I think transcripts are a good start to kind of bring us up to speed on, on taking the existing um, visual content and making them available to everyone. But I think we can move on from that and do some really, really cool stuff around tactile comics um, and uh, really cool interactive HTML comics. I'm super excited about the future. And if anyone wants to talk about that more, let me know. Uh, but yeah, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you for having me as the first speaker. This is a really awesome event, and I feel really um, honored to be part of ID24. Hashtag ID24. Cool. And I am done, Billy. <laughs> wow, that was awesome. Um, that is... I'm, I'm struggling because I, I muted the other two, and now I can't figure out how to unmute them. There we go. OK, good. <laughs> Are we back? Yeah, I have. I Way have, too I, early for you to be stealing the limelight, Gregory, honestly. Come on. I know. Here. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm new. <laughs> I'm new. <laughs> that was amazing, Cordelia. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. And judging by the, the, the tweets we've been getting in, uh, a lot of other people out there enjoying it, too. So thank you very much. Glad to talk about. There's a lot more that I could talk about, but I wanted to just scratch the surface <laughs> of like comics and accessibility. Pretty cool pairing. That's really great, and I love the idea that that you were talking about tactile comics. I, I think that's a, a fascinating kind of proposition. It's, uh... Yes, it's something that I really, because um, as I mentioned, I'm a cartoonist. I've never made tactile mm -hmm. comics, and that's something that I really, I really want to buy a 3D printer and start doing that. We get some clay mm -hmm. and, and just see where it goes, yeah. Right, and I think as a blind person myself, one of the things I often struggle with with tactile kind of diagrams and, and pictures is there's, there's so much going on, there's so many different textures, but I, my visual memory of comics is, is that they tend to be kind of quite big, quite bold, you know, in, in their visual yeah. presentation, which actually I think might lend itself really well to, to comics. Uh, yeah. The, or it could be completely wrong. No, I, I think so. Like the shape reader, I just thought was a really cool concept of of layering these textures on each other. Because I've also, um, you know, there's been a lot of explorations around 3D printing comics and literally taking existing comics and three and and raising the lines. But you lose so much by just feeling the lines of that versus feeling something that is maybe a lot more three dimensional and that has all these different textures to it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so we have, I, oh, I was really back. fascinated also um, around the audio described comics. I think that's fascinating and look forward to finding some more about that as well. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have much to say about it aside from check out Comics in Power because they're doing a lot of really cool stuff around audio comics. So we have. I, I did have a. I did have a. I had a question, Billy. Before we jump into those questions. Yeah, go ahead. Do, do you, does the does the author need to be doing their own description, or do you find? Because I would think that they have to, right? That is something that I've been trying to figure out myself. Because I so I ran into an issue when I was transcribing one of my comics where I drew something that was it was a bad drawing, and so I wasn't conveying visually what I meant to convey. And so then I was like, so in my transcript, do I convey what I actually meant to convey? Or do I just state what I actually meant? Or do I state what it looks like, which is not what I actually meant? Um, and I kind of had this whole debate with myself about what is the appropriate way to do this. And, and I thought, well, maybe it would be good to have another person transcribe the comic for me because they can, um, they have that objectivity. Uh, they don't know what my initial intent is. Um, but actually, if you read this um, on Transcribing Comics essay uh, by Leanna Kerr, she goes into that a lot in depth because, she, because as someone transcribing someone else's comics, she really has to think really critically about like, is, is you know, again, with the, the idea of using color, symbolic colors, um, is it intentional that they use this color or accidental? Like, what is the author's intention? And that's something that only the author knows. So it's an interesting balance between 
do you want to um, convey what the reader, what a reader of the comic would see, or what you intended the reader of the comic to see? I don't know if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay. So we had a couple of other questions. Um, yeah. First, you're you're gonna check your Twitter, and you're gonna see that it is blown up because it's people up. people loved your talk. Um, <laughs> we did have one question asking you what you thought uh, about uh, XKCD. What? Like, oh man! What about XKCD? I don't know, man. I'm just reading the question. <laughs> uh, they just said, what, do you, what do you think about it? explain XKCD? Um, well, there is a website so, that explains XKCD too. Yeah, I, I think that's story. I, was, I, I left out a keyword there. That was my fault. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think they, they asked you what you thought about that website in particular. About the explain XKCD website? Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I haven't um, looked at it recently. Uh, one thing that I think is really interesting about XKCD and a few other comics um, like it is that they make heavy use of the t title tag, um, which is interesting because they kind of use the title tag as a as a um, as an Easter egg, um, and that's kind of interesting from an accessibility perspective because there are a lot of other reasons to use and not to use a title tag, but. Um, Easter eggs usually aren't one of them, except in comics. Oh, oh, okay. So explain XKCD. I'm now on the website now. I just realized that they actually have a transcript at the end of each explanation, um, and that is rad. Cool. Okay. Arguably, uh, arguably, so I'd say that should be on on the <laughs> XKCD website itself. Anyway, sorry, Leone. I just said the interesting. Last time I checked, uh, a, a friend of mine told me and I assume it's still the case, but actually if you look into the code of the XKCD original cartoons, there is actually a description there. There used to be a long description in there, um, but for some reason it's it's not presented in a way that's actually oh. available on the page itself. I don't know if that's still the case, they might have cleaned it up or got rid of it, but it was in the code for a long time, which is kind of interesting that they've, they've sort of done the hard work, they just haven't exposed it. <laughs> interesting, huh. Yeah. And I think right. there, okay, well, I think we just oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, you. Oh, I, I think that um, I think XKCD is one of the comics that um, is in the the Ono oh Robot transcription search engine that I mentioned earlier. Right, that may be it. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. So I think we're just uh, just wrapping up this session now, or it's coming to an end. Um, care to give us a, a quick parting shot? If 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 people out there could do one thing to make comics more inclusive um oh gosh <laughs> digital comics or or tactile comics any kind uh, anything you like digital comics add a text description of it anywhere mm -hmm. if you can add it in all text great if you can add it below the image that's even better because it reaches a wider audience uh, start small and then work up to a larger transcripts Great. Sounds like pretty good advice to me. Once again, Cordelia, thank you so much for this this great talk, sure and it's thing. been a pleasure listening to you kick off our ID 24 2017. Woo! Yeah. Excited. Uh, for everybody else, <laughs> we'll be taking a 10 minute break now. Uh, we're gearing up for Eric Bailey, who's going to be uh, taking us into hour two of ID 24 uh, with a talk on CSS media queries.